knew it. If you are joining us on the video, we are so glad that you are. Thank you for following along with this um, free wheeling conversation about Genesis. And uh, sometime let me know that you are watching so that I have a sense of who's participating in this Bible study. We're just really grateful that you are. All right, beloveds. Um, today, of course, is September 11th. And so let us pause. And I will offer on our behalf this prayer written by the late uh, Frank Griswold, who was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church and quite a theologian. And his words ring true and continue to be a lament and a prayer petition all these years later. So let us pray. God, the compassionate one, whose loving care extends to all nations. We remember this day your children of many nations and many faiths, whose lives were cut short by the fierce flames of anger and hatred. Console those who continue to suffer and grieve and give them comfort and hope as they look to the future. Out of what we have endured, give us the grace to examine our relationships with those who perceive us as the enemy and show our leaders the way to use our power to serve the good of all for the healing of the nations. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in reconciling love was lifted up from the earth that he might draw all things to himself. Amen. 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 Good morning, Kim. So good morning. Good morning, guys. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> You're not late at all. You're just on time. Kim, I'd love to introduce you to my friend Eileen. I don't know if you can see her. She's joining Hi, Eileen. New York. Uh, hopefully, she'll be able to join us for a couple of weeks. Hi, Kim. Off of Hi, nice to see you. Kim, how's Spencer? How did it go last week? He's, he's doing well. Yeah, he's doing well. He's in good spirits. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, fun to hear about all the new school activities and friends and kind of going back to all of that. So it was good. You know? Good. Is he a junior this year? Yes. Can you believe it? And I, you're an empty nester, Patty. I am. I am. <laughs> How's it going? Just that. We're f fine. <laughs> just <laughs> fine. I refuse to believe that. <laughs> You're at the movies with me. <laughs> Eileen used to babysit for my babies way oh, back. How cute! Oh. She used to hold Andrew in church. Now try that. Um, oh, precious. The St. Dunstan's crew knows Andrew because he has been one of our many live stream, not many actually, one of our few live stream ministers since coming back from the pandemic. So we feel his absence. Anyway, um, let us get on with our work. And I was wondering, would somebody, we are about to take a turn in the road in the narrative about Abraham and his family. And I'm wondering, would somebody like to just kind of recap what we know about Abraham so far, partially because Eileen hasn't been with us and this will be a good refresher for her. Um, and just partially to, you know, as a way of collecting ourselves before we move on. What's up with Abraham? Oh, they've been paying attention so well. <laughs> Let's start with Abraham. <laughs> Let's start with very basic facts. Who is Abraham? Well, he used to be Abram. Mm -hmm. And he was selected by God because he was a righteous man to be the father of many nations. Okay. Married to Sarah. <clears throat> he <clears throat> seemed to wander around quite a bit where he occasionally pimped out his wife for gain. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> which makes me oh, believe I like this guy. <laughs> that he didn't really have that much faith in God's promises. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, he, uh, his, what was his nephew, Lot? Mm-hmm got you know some territory but we know that didn't end well 
That's right. And Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. And then, you know, God jerked him around pretty good by telling him he was going to have to sacrifice Isaac. Oh, I guess we haven't gotten to Isaac being born yet. Well, we, yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. Isaac. Yeah. Isaac so was like Isaac. That. Yeah. Sarah was too old for childbearing. Uh, so she sent, you know, her Egyptian slave in to uh, try and get a get a male heir. And they got uh, what, Seth, not Seth. Hagar. Hagar. Hagar and, and Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael. Ishmael. Yes. Call Ishmael. me Ishmael. Call me Ishmael. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, then Sarah did produce Isaac. And so uh, Hagar was dumped in the desert where God saved them so that they could become the Arabs. And, you know, then God told, tested uh, Abraham in a way that I think most people in this particular uh, culture would fail miserably. Mm. If Patty ever gets up and says, I want you to sacrifice your son, she's going to be preaching to empty pews. <laughs> and uh, that, you know, so then they came back. Yes, there weren't many family, family counselors back then, so they just had to kind of live with it. <laughs> Good job. And, oh. That's about where we are. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great job, Fred. You get an A. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Anything that strikes you or that you've been thinking about as we've been talking about Abraham? Well, Abraham bought a piece of ground to bury his wife, Sarah, I believe, yeah, and mm -hmm. buried her and, and then set off for Egypt. I mean... Again, and, I mean, then set off again, I should say. And one of the things we talked about last week was the, the significance of buying the burial plot gave him a foothold um, and therefore he owned property, which is significant in this relationship between Abraham and the land. Anything else? He bought considerably more land than would be required to bury Sarah. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of those countries now where if you invest half a million dollars, you can be a citizen. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Portugal yeah. had that, but uh, they've dropped it now. Oh, well. But, you know, he, it gave him a permanent foothold in the land. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly. Anything else as we're thinking about Abraham? Fred mentioned Abraham trying to pimp out Sarah a couple of times. And one of the things I think we talked about two weeks ago was when Abraham was talking to, and now I can't remember the king's name, but the righteous king. And, Abimelech. Yes, Abimelech, thank you. Um, and was saying, oh, well, you know, I, I told her that from the beginning where we are actually distantly related and we had this deal that whenever we went into a new land, she would say she was my sister. Okay, maybe some revisionist uh, storytelling there, Abraham. Um, all right, last call for any other thoughts. One thing I'll just say in response to, to Fred's really great synopsis, was you know, we talk so much about the faith of Abraham. And Fred was saying, well, you know, how much faith does Abraham have in God, which is a really good question. And if you think about it, God actually at this point isn't asking Abraham to have faith. He just tells him to go. He doesn't say, believe in me, make me your one God. Um, it's really about this movement and this obedience. And, you know, more or less Abraham is obedient because there's something in it for him. It's certainly transactional. Um, so, okay, if there's nothing else at this point. So as Elon said, we, at the end of la the last chapter, 23, we saw Abraham burying his wife, Sarah. And I'll just read that last paragraph again, just to remind uh, us about where we are. 
So the field of Ephron in Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, passed to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites, in the presence of all who went in at the gate of his city. So to Fred's point, that's way more property than he would have needed to bury Sarah. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, facing Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it passed from the Hittites into Abraham's possession as a burying place. And so that's where we left off last time. So now we are kind of fast forwarding a little bit. And I would love it if somebody would like to read for us these first 14 verses of Genesis 24. And again, we've got that dumb arrow that I will try to move out of your way um, as you read. Would someone like to do that for us? I'd be happy to do that, Patty. Thanks, John. Okay. Uh, now Abraham was old advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live, but will go to my country and to my kindred and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow unto this land. Must, must I take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord of heaven took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send the angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son, for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from uh, this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master, and set out and went to Aram Naharim in the city of Nahur. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was towards evening, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman with whom I shall say, please offer me your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one who you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Thank you so much, John. Okay. What do you want to talk about? What strikes you here? What, what's this business of the hand under the thigh of Abraham? I was wondering who was going to be the first to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about this? <laughs> Does it happen anywhere else in the Bible? Well, <laughs> um, I thought I would share with you what our buddy Robert Alter says in the notes to his translation. Remember, Alter is a Hebrew scripture scholar and uh, has done his own translation, and his notes are, are really quite good. So even though we don't necessarily read his translation, just because it's hard to show the whole thing on the screen, um, it is good to go back and look at his notes sometimes. So he says about that, 
Holding the genitals or placing a hand next to the genitals during an act of solemn oath taking is attested in several ancient societies, a fact already noted by Ibn Ezra in the 12th century, though here it may have the special purpose of invoking the place of procreation as the servant is to seek a bride for the only son, Isaac. Um, so it, it's noteworthy, this, this uh, tradition, this custom. Yeah. So the servant does what Abraham says and puts his hand under there. What else strikes you? Why doesn't Isaac go with him to kind of pick out his own wife? Ah, good question. Yeah, Isaac is notably absent from this exchange. He's old. Isaac's not old. Ab uh, no, Abraham. Oh, uh, Isaac. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Isaac Abraham. might not come. Might not come back. You know, he, he mm, might find true. a honey and settle down back in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> As happens. <laughs> I think so, Abraham still may not be speaking too. <laughs> <laughs> Isaac, Isaac may not want to be anywhere near Abraham. Very right. good point, Jackie. Along yeah. putting his hand under his thigh. <laughs> <laughs> so why not one of the daughters of the Canaanites? Uh, what's what's behind that kind of exclusion? Great question. They He's going to have to displace the Canaanites over the land. So. Hmm. You know, that, that taking a wife from there might result in divided loyalties. Why not merge with them instead of displace them, right? Yeah. God right. said they're <laughs> God said they're toast. But that was much later. No, it, he said earlier that he would displace well. the people oh, okay. of, of the gates. Mm -hmm. That you know, you here's your land and you're gonna displace them. So Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. No worries. It gets confusing with the chronology. Yeah. So, but that's a great question. Why, why not merge? Why not assimilate with the Canaanites? No, it seems very clear that Abraham wants to keep his lineage separate, although he has this foothold, you know, he wants to, to be on the land, but he doesn't want anything to do with the Canaanites. Is it the I belief? wonder. Sorry. Go ahead, Ewan. Is it a belief thing that Abram has this belief in the one God, the Canaanites turn? Yeah. That's exactly where I was going, Ewan. Mm -hmm. well, well, God has not chosen to show himself to the Canaanites, so it's kind of on him that they don't believe. Mm -mm. Well, that's a side issue. If you're, if you're going to have a chosen people, I think it's got to be, you know, it's Abraham and his progeny, if you just went out and merged with all the Canaanites, that sort of, you sort of lose the the chosenness if it can simply be by marriage. So there's a purity to the lineage, right? Um, well, gotta have that purity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a New Testament gal. I'll take the Old Testament, it's the word of God, but now I see, I'm really seeing <laughs> why people looked at Jesus like, and what planet are you from, exactly. sir? <laughs> good point, Eileen. Very good point. And, and that's, I think, I, I'm glad you said that, because I think as we read Genesis and as we, for this, we read Job, we haven't done a lot. Of well, you do all the fun books. I and know. <laughs> um, we haven't done a lot of Old Testament in this Bible study. We're mostly New Testament kinds of folks, too. However, when we do do Hebrew scripture, it, you know, it really does set a context, right? And it's very helpful to under, I think it helps us understand where Jesus is coming from a lot better to have this background. So I'm glad you said that. What else do you notice or strike? What else strikes you? I guess I was struck a little bit by the servant pleading to God to show his love to Abraham mm. by, you know, finding the woman, doing all this stuff and, and show me how I, you know, he, all he had to do was say, I couldn't find anybody and he was freed from his oath. So yeah, there's, keep there's the camels this love. And keep moving. 
Mm -hmm. there's this love of Abraham that that comes at least in that second big hunk of things that uh, struck me because I'm not sure where that's coming from the ma- yeah. out of the mouth of the servant. Yeah. Uh, also, I just caught because I live in a house where feminism is a issue. Uh, a, a constant topic, not a contentious one. Uh, there's on verse eight that the, the woman uh, it, it has agency there. If she's not willing to follow you, then you will be free. Uh, that I didn't expect to see that there, but looking at it, looking looking at it, wire brushed as I am. Oh yes, I can see that now. X, I'm so glad you called attention to that. But the son doesn't have agency. The son is not supposed to depart <laughs> from the land. He's supposed to be stuck with the land. He just wants to go get away from back home. Poor Isaac. It can't be easy yeah. to be Isaac. That's, I've often thought that. Uh, obviously, this is 22 and that whole hor- horrific episode that we had, were so troubled by a couple weeks ago. Um, but not just that. Exactly, Mark, that he's this pawn, right? He's mm. he's a means to an end, right. but the relationship doesn't seem particularly uh, developed or mutual or affectionate. It would, again, to Jackie's point, you know, be hard to have affection for Abraham after that. Um, I wanted to go back you know, to when uh, Ray said that about, oh no, John, when John was talking about the loyalty to Abraham and, and all of that. Um, mm-hmm. Num- uh, verse two, Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his house who had charge of all that he had. So this servant has a place of status in the mm-hmm. household. And um, in many ways, and especially given what you were just saying about Isaac, uh, Mark, you know, if you compare the servant and Isaac, there is more of a relationship with the servant, I think, mm-hmm. than there is with the son, which it's just really interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Interesting but, that the servant this, remains unnamed. Uh huh. Would, um, would this be the servant to whom everything was going to go? That's what I was thinking too, Jackie. Um, uh, Eleazar, uh, who was before Ishmael and Isaac's birth, oh, Eleazar was supposed to re- uh, inherit. He was the, the steward of the household, and he was supposed to inherit everything. I wonder, and I don't know. Let me just check my Interesting. Notes. Yeah. Let me check. I, I never thought of that. What would happen if you died childless, which, of course, was, you know, something to not even be thought of in that time and place. But it mm-hmm. would go to your servants? That's interesting. Well, no. The tribe would choose a new leader. That's ah. Leaders were not necessarily, you know, my understanding for nomadic tribes and very primitive tribes is leadership was not hereditary. Oh, no, no. I wasn't talking about the leadership. I, I misunderstood oh, then. Sure. I was thinking of like the worldly possessions, yeah. which would tempt the strongest of us to maybe fiddle around a bit. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, but I mean, the you know, if Abraham died, you know, I think they would hold the equivalent of a new election. Well, to find I, I, a new leader. But that's, Who gets that's, the goats? Yeah, but that's not what uh, Jackie was asking about. Jackie was the back before the births of the sons. Um, Abraham Abram is talking to God after he has receives this promise that he's going to be the father of generations. And Abraham said, "Well, how will this be?" You know, I'm old and childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar, my my Fine. steward. So, you know, it makes it clear that at that point, the um, intention was for the servant to inherit, and then of course Isaac displaces that. Um, but so it's I'm glad you asked that question, Jackie. My uh, notes, my study Bible notes, don't say whether it's the same servant. I'm in kind of inclined to think it is, um, yes. given his status in the household. Well, I also think you're kind of pushing the envelope here when you're you know, for the candidates. You know, you not only 
have to give water to the uh you know to the servant but you also have to volunteer to water his 10 camels mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I mean you that, yeah, that's the secret handshake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but he's, he's he's asking for a sign. Exactly. Yeah, so he can't yeah. just come out and offer me water. Well, yeah, I, I find that interesting. Want because you know, you can ask for a simple sign and not get it, and he asks for a pretty generous sign. Right. Yeah, yeah should be asking that'll for make... more generous signs. You have to have the password. Exactly, exactly. Wow. That was a lot of camels to be taking to do this mission. Yeah, well, I let's don't know. talk about camels for a second. Um, because uh, da, 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 da. Alter talks about, about camels, and I thought you all might appreciate this. The camels here and elsewhere in Genesis are a problem. Archaeological, <laughs> those, <laughs> those problematic camels, archaeological and extra yeah, <laughs> literary <laughs> evidence indicates the camels were not adopted as beasts of burden until several centuries after the patriarchal period. Um. So their introduction in the story would have to be anachronistic. What's puzzling is that the narrative reflects <laughs> careful attention to other details of historic authenticity. Horses, which also were domesticated centuries later, are scrupulously excluded from the patriarchal tales. And when Abraham buys a gravesite, he deals in weights of silver, not in coins, as in the later Israelite period. The details of betrothal negotiation with the brother acting as principal agent for the family, the bestowal of a dowry on the bride and betrothal gifts on the family, are equally accurate for the middle of the second millennium BCE. Perhaps the camels are an in, inadvertent anachronism because they become so deeply associated in the minds of later writers and audiences with de desert travel. I'm not having trouble reading. There remains a possibility that camels may have already had some restricted use in the earlier period for long desert journeys, even though they were not yet generally employed. In any case, the camels here are more than a prop for their needs and treatment are turned into a pivot of the plot mm -hmm. and exactly this sign that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just thought you'd be interested in that because remember mm -hmm. Genesis is written down generations after the events that uh, happen in the narrative. And uh, so, you know, it's very possible that there are some anachronistic details that are put back in, but without the camels, you know, they are a significant plot device here. So I just thought you would be interested in that. I think yeah, I'm for not me, sure that that's a conscious anachronism. I mean, the people who were writing later on, they may have thought that the camels were in use, you know, all the way back through history. They wouldn't and have known, right? They weren't trying to make something up for a point. They just said, yeah, of course they were using camels back then. We use them now, don't we? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems to me that the, what, the 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 camels carry a lot of treasure uh for a dowry or whatever and our uh, bride price. And uh so it's a sign of wealth. It would mm -hmm. also be a sign of ostentation coming into the area. Mm -hmm. And the, the the sequence of uh being greeted by somebody who either is attracted by the wealth and recognizes that and or uh, is good at hospitality, is it reflective mm -hmm. hospitality and welcoming uh, the outsider, as the, we read so many times, is uh, welcoming the alien. So she is she has social skills that would be very attractive to uh, anybody. That's beautiful, Ray. We and exact we have heard at least a couple of times about the importance of maybe three times already in the Abraham cycle about the importance of hospitality. And we think about entertaining angels unawares at the, the door of the tent. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah and when the, the strangers come into town and the townspeople are not hospitable to them. So you know, this theme of hospitality comes up over and over again. Um, excellent. Excellent. And and it is a 
visual sign of Abraham's wealth, which we know, you know, he has accrued his wealth largely from um, his time in Egypt. Um, and, you know, it could be considered ill-gotten gain when Pharaoh said, here, take all this and go, get out of here, because um, <laughs> Pharaoh was not, was suffering as a result of incident oh. with Sarah. Someone was going to say, was it you, John? Just, yeah, just one last observation, I think, before we go on that, again, because we have done the New Testament, the fact that the women come at the evening time to mm -hmm. draw the well, you know, now drives home to me what you explained, that no, they don't go out at noon when Jesus met the woman at the well. Beautiful. I guess that would be well known to the, uh, to the Jewish tradition. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm -hmm. It would be well known. Huh? Uh, oh, sorry, girl. <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was not intended. That I know, but <laughs> I'm the one who uh, who made a thing of it. Sorry about that. All right. Well, should we go on with the story? Could somebody read these next two paragraphs, fifteen through twenty-seven? Sure. Thanks, Fred. Can you see it? Okay. Yeah, I'm not able, I don't have it up on my other screen, but I can see yours. Okay, good. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me sip, sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. Ha. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring <laughs> weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels and said, tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of straw and fodder and a place to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who, sorry, you have to go up a little bit. Hey, hang on one second. Has not, for, uh, has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kin. Thank you, Fred. So the plot thickens. Uh -huh. So they're marrying, keeping it in the family again. Yeah. Yeah. Why is she why is she so nice to him? I mean, this guy wanders in around there with all the camels and she's Yeah, sure, I'll do all this stuff for you. Uh, how come? I mean all, because she knew the money. Place. All of the money, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to say, you drive up in a big Ferrari, signs. you run out, you shine it up. <laughs> yeah. and say, Can I help He you was here? obviously a prosperous person, yeah. and he had a gold nose ring weighing half a <laughs> shekel. I got a yeah. nose ring for you. Yeah. Oh, the nose ring. The nose, I forgot about the nose ring. <laughs> <laughs> I very rarely see you lose composure, Fred, but when you got to the nose ring, you giggled and it was so cute. It was like, okay. Well, you know, I have been, in my younger days, I have been out clubbing and I never had much luck with the nose ring gambit. <laughs> There's a picture. I got the visual. I used to think of nose rings as something you put in a recalcitrant bull. Yeah, <laughs> but apparently it isn't what they had in mind. Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that, given the time and place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Women she's property. <laughs> she's marrying age, and here is an obviously prosperous person who has ten camels and some some gold to spend. I can see that you know she might have had her eye on him without knowing that he was rep only representing somebody else. So hence John's Ferrari analogy. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. 
what else? And then in you never know I grew up with four older brothers, would you? you know? <laughs> yep. <laughs> You're not so big. <laughs> And here we have that theme of hospitality again, right? That Ray mentioned. Tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? So, if, you know, identify your lineage. So he's, you know, kicking the tires to make sure she's not a Canaanite and or some other tradition, um, nationality, and then requesting hospitality. And Was this the start of traveling salesman jokes? <laughs> so he's he's requesting hospitality but he's flashing his oh. wad of hundred dollar bills oh, gosh. <laughs> exactly we have plenty of straw and fodder and a place to spend the night she adds and so she passes the test i wanted to share with you all uh something from Alter. Let's see if I can make this bigger. We've talked a little bit, and, and John brought up, I'm so glad you did, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, that we spent a lot of time talking about. And so we've talked before about the significance of Georgia. in the Bible. And in fact, Hagar, when Hagar yeah. was banished okay. from... Abraham and Sarah's household twice. And in both cases, she okay. encountered a, uh, a well. All right, I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Oh, okay. Um, but the altar has this to say. The well at an oasis is obviously a symbol of fertility and in all likelihood a female symbol as well. The drawing of water from the well is the act that emblematically establishes a bond, male-female, host-guest, benefactor, benefited, between the stranger and the girl. And its apt result is the excited running to bring the news, the gestures of hospitality, the actual betrothal. The plot of the type scene then dramatically enacts the coming together of mutually unknown parties in the marriage. And this is an interesting chapter in Alter's book, The Art of Biblical Narrative, because he talks about some of these tropes, some of these, these types. Um, and the well clearly is an example of that. Um, I think I'll do the next Very one. Very yeah. 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 Do you want to say more about that? Uh, it just seems like the, the, he is my, excuse me, I don't mean the pun, but he is, he's mined that metaphor of the well uh, in so many ways. To, to, they're identifying archetypes that mm -hmm. are common to cross cultures. And uh, that, I went immediately to Joseph Campbell and the uh, excellent and mythologies. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I thought I would read this next bit as well. Um, and we can go back and look at the text after reading this. It's only in this betrothal scene that the girl, not the stranger, draws water from the well. Indeed, the narrator goes out of his way to give weight to this act by presenting Rebecca as a continuous whirl of purposeful activity. And we'll, we'll look at that in a second. In four short verses, she is the subject of 11 verbs of action and one of speech going down to the well, drawing water, filling the pitcher, pouring, giving drink. Rebecca is to become the shrewdest and the most potent of the matriarchs. And we'll see what she's up to in a little while. And so it is entirely appropriate that she should dominate her betrothal scene. I'm um, sorry, Sue's not with us today, right? You can tell her that we're talking about female power and agency with Rebecca. Um, so Rebecca dominates her betrothal scene. Let's, let me, oh dear, this is frozen. Hang on. Let me see if I can get this to unfreeze. Okay. Well, if I do that, it'll disconnect us. Okay. Come on. Think warm thoughts. 
Exactly. Oh, I hate when it does this. All right. I may lose you, in which case I'll come right back. Let me force quit and see. Okay. Oh, good. There you are. You're still here. Oh, okay. the kids call rage quitting the video <laughs> games. <laughs> All right. Let me call back. Uh, he, okay, good. Now it's just being slow. Come on. Come on, buddy. Come on. Come on, pal. So, Eileen, who's your kitty these days? Well, I got Max at my feet here. He's a little freaked out because uh, he's not used to this. He's a 16 pound chicken. Poor baby was feral. <laughs> He was Aww. living on 161st Street when my rescue found him. Aww. And I still have Sheila, that sweet little calico. She's 14. <laughs> well, Jackie has two kittens with her. We saw Puck earlier. Oh, I know. I saw the tree <laughs> behind and I said, what, kindred spirit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, one, one of them has stepped on my, my uh, keyboard. So I can't see you now. But oh, I'm oh, dear. <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> oh, one of mine, back during COVID, one of mine mooned, literally mooned my supervisor. Thank <laughs> God she thought it was hilarious. She looked right. up and it was his cat butt right in the face. <laughs> my Joey. I don't look much like Taylor Smith, but I am a cat lady. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, we will <laughs> we won't pursue that. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So as we're not snacking on them. <laughs> all right, all right. Oh. Okay. All right, children. Um, because <laughs> you know, I I could follow that thread right down, but I you won't. invited me, Patty. I, I mean, know. I know. I know. <laughs> anyway, uh, back to Rebecca and her agency. So let's take a look at this. Um, and you know, look at you no know, alter makes the point that you know she is given all these action verbs, um, and she is sort of in control of the scene. And I leave it to you to decide whether you buy that or not. But it would be useful in this trope for her to take. Um, I'm just gonna sit there and read for a little bit. Baby Wade, I don't do any more than that. Oh, my towel. I don't think I got my big towel. I need to You're it. frozen. Am I? I you were for me. I can hear and see you all. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, You're okay. Okay. So what do you all think about that? I, I, I don't think that she's in control. She seems to me to be responding. Okay. Um, and um, it, it's as if... You know, she's rushing around in a frenzy of activity, but at the request and at the the urging of the stranger, of the okay. of the, the servant. Okay. So, so she's sort of taking the initiative and saying, I'll do all this wonderful stuff for you. She's she seems to be responding to his needs and interests. Okay. Fair enough. But she does have, she is an active, what can maybe say this, she's an active participant. She's not a set piece just sitting beatifically. She is active. Um, and if the she's the chosen one, she is doesn't have agency here. Well, right. But the point is that she is doing something. And um, again, the as Alter says, the fact that she is the one who pours the water would be unusual in this type scene, as he calls them. Um, and so she is, which of course aligns with the request for the sign, right? When Abraham says, you know, she, if she pours water and if she waters the camels, then she's your girl. Um, and so, but there is all, you know, she is doing all of these things. She's not just a two-dimensional, She like the camels, she's not a prop either. She's an active participant. I think that's what I take away from Alter's analysis. And then she gets a, a gold ring out of it. I mean, a nose ring out of it. So uh, there you that's go. Total loss. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted also to show you a piece of art. Eileen, 
as my friends here will tell you, I almost always incorporate some visual. Uh, and this piece is Beautiful. from Syria in the seventh century. I'm gonna see if I can zoom in on it. Mm. Um, this is a larger set uh, or a series of images that, that tell the story. So it's called the Vienna Genesis. Oh, don't, I don't know why it's called the Vienna Genesis if it's Syrian. Um, but you see the two, uh, let's see, I can't zoom in on it. Okay, there you go. Can you see it now? Oops, mm -hmm. sorry. All right, so there, here, there are two scenes together. Uh, so here we have Rebecca approaching the well with her jar on her shoulder, standing upright. Um, we'll talk about this feature over here, this uh -huh. person to the left in a minute. But then down here, we have Rebecca pouring the water directly into the servant's mouth. And then here we have all the camels. Um, they look scared. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they're like this, kind of like in a defensive posture. Yeah. I wonder if that was intentional. Good they look like snakes getting ready to strike. <laughs> oh, that's another one. Yeah, like cobras. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, so uh, the commentary on this piece that I read said that this figure here, this is a sprite or a naiad. Um, you know, so... A, you know, a, a mythical figure having, you know, connected to water. And apparently, and it's too bad that Chuck's not with us today, but this is a, a common motif in uh, Hellenistic art to have her there. And the commentator I read said, it wasn't Alter, it was an art commentator, who said that perhaps this figure is here to accentuate uh, female power or, you know, the, the strength of the feminine in this scene. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. Um, but I just thought this was interesting to show you all. Um, and then see if I can, okay, let me, and then here's another bit of uh, commentary. Um, so this, these uh, commentators said, it seems quite clear that in many cases, the pictures in this uh, larger piece, Vienna Genesis, are based on literary midrashim, both Jewish and Christian, or that they themselves are visual midrashim created by the artists. And I just, I wanted to focus on that phrase, visual midrashim, because we've talked before about how art is a form of midrash, right? It is a form of telling the story and bringing out uh, nuances and details that might not be in the written narrative. So that's the only reason I, I showed that, um, because since we do use so much art in this Bible study, it's just a different way of thinking about the text and engaging our imagination in it. So um, does anyone want to say anything more about the visual here? Okay. What, what's the castle doing in the background? Good question. Very good question. Well, that's that a city? the city. That's the city, city. gates. That... Yeah, but uh, I, I didn't have that kind of image of the culture they lived in. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. exactly. Well, people tend to create sometimes in the vision of their time. I often have this argument with my 34-year-old son. For instance, we were talking about the moon landing and mm -hmm. he flat out refused to believe me that people were literally terrified that those astronauts were not going to come back. And there was no idea what they were going to be landing on. Oh, my God, Bob, that's ridiculous. How could they not know? I said, because you were born in 1990. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. where this was all that already. Exactly. Point. Even in art, it drives me crazy in movies. There's a great movie called Sweet Liberty with Alan Alda, where he plays a history professor who goes to battle against the Hollywood director making a movie of his book. It's, well, I have my vision, and this is the way I see things. So that's the way it was then, because that's all I know. You know mm -hmm. They don't want to think anything was ever any different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. But. 
Well, and it makes sense, right? And and we could even go so far when we talk about Christian art, where Jesus is blonde and blue eyed. Um, you know, clearly Jesus and he was from not, Israel. <laughs> yeah, which Jesus clearly would not have been blonde and blue eyed, but the artist represents him in the way that makes sense to that culture. So we see some of these features. Um, and and when we were talking about the sacrifice of Isaac, near sacrifice of Isaac, a couple of weeks ago, one of the pieces of art we looked at had, you know, a castle or a house in the background, a very pastoral scene and a very European scene. Uh, so I guess that's in keeping with that motif. Um, all right, let's see. We've got about seven minutes. Should we push on a little bit? This is 24 is a long chapter, so we won't finish the whole chapter today but um how about yeah. could we read these um how about we read these next two paragraphs would someone like to read 28 through 41 i'll do it thanks Eileen. can you see it okay i see 34 could you bring it to 28 yeah now it's you're bringing it to 42 it's but, up at the top. Can you see, can you see at the, the top? top? All I see is, and he has given him all he has. My master made me swear. Yeah, I've been, I don't know why I've been ahead of everyone else. It's weird. I mean, I have my Bible open next to me. Is it going to be that much different? No, uh-uh. Go oh, ahead. Okay. Can you do 28 through 41. Okay, 28. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man to the spring. As soon as he had seen the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebecca, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and there he was, standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside when I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man came into the house and Laban unloaded the camels and gave him straw and fodder for the camels and water to wash his feet at the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told my Aaron. He said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become he has wealthy. Become he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys, and Sarah, my master's wife, a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, Canaanites in whose land I live but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and make your way successful. You shall get a wife for my son, from my kindred, from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my kindred, even if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. And that's it, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that. let's pause there just because otherwise it will be too much to talk about. Uh, thank you, Eileen. What strikes you as the story continues? There's a little addition in the, his recounting of his mission. Uh, he adds the idea of the uh, the uh, the Lord before whom I walk will send His angel with you and make yeah. your way successful. That uh, didn't appear in the original set of instructions, and I'm wondering if he's ad libbing just to make it seem as though he's got the blessing of God Himself for doing this. Very interesting. So the servant's doing a little midrash himself. He's he's adding to the story. Hasn't he though just received a message from God where he said, you know, boy, whoever comes and drinks, then I'll do it. And wow, there she is. So maybe the angel messenger was there, or he's experienced that having been there. Hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It sounds like going to the well is a is sort of like an initial step for courtship, like how we would go to a bar in you know, <laughs> 1995. The gathering place. Uh, so that the brother is almost expectant of one day the sister will come home and be like, hey, I picked up this guy at the well. <laughs> You know, because and he gave me like his cool just, nose ring. Yeah, like it's just like a matter of course that this would happen. You know, hey, I'm prepared. I'm always prepared for guests. I've got the space for the camels. Come on in. My sister told me about you. Mm -hmm. um, he can visually see that he's wealthy, mm -hmm. but it always makes you wonder in the back of your mind because when we're reading this, we're we're reading it from a perspective. At this point, like they're not saying, well, Rebecca has received a sign that mm -hmm. you know, when this person walks up to her and says, can I have a drink of water? This is the sign that she's been waiting for. You know, who knows mm -hmm. what goes on on the other half, you know? Excellent point, Kim. Because they're so open. Why? Why? Yeah. You know? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Especially to a foreigner, a stranger, you know, it's not like, oh, it's, you know, Jim Jones's brother, son, sister, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's somebody new. Mm -hmm. Well, they, the they outlined the kinship relationships earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did the Jewish geography. And maybe I'm stuck on, you know, a minor detail, but the whole thing with the ring, with the nose ring, and the bracelets, which are also a ring. To this day, we use wedding rings. It's not a wedding pin or a wedding hat. Now, does the ring symbolize an eternity or a never-ending pledge? I mean, because it's the nose ring. Maybe when the brother sees the nose ring, this isn't just, isn't just, oh, some guy passing by who's asking for hospitality. This is someone who wants, you know, an emissary for someone who wants to marry my sister. I don't know. It also seems like bondage in a way, mm. you know, that mm. he he represents somebody else, somebody bigger than him, you know. Mm -hmm. These bracelets and the nose ring are really attributed to the master's wealth and um, symbols of the master, almost like a cross is for us, or I don't know. Mm. Maybe I'm reaching. <laughs> well, maybe it would make her easier to lead back home. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Fred. <laughs> oh, there you go. I want to hang out with Fred. <laughs> yeah, you do. When you I do. come down to Maryland, Fred and I going to have coffee. <laughs> He'll make it for you. Um, so I have to ask Louise if she has a nose ring. Did you give her a nose ring, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> I was smarter than that. <laughs> so breathing, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Very wise man. Very wise. Please. There's the premarital counseling question. <laughs> Who's going to wear the nose ring in this house? <laughs> oh, you all are the best. You all are the best. Well, uh, anything else before we quit? It's a lot deeper in the New Testament now. I'm a typical, you know, raised Catholic, no Episcopal, dip into the old here and there, but really... Everything was new, you know, growing up. So, mm -hmm. well, that's why this is so much fun because it's, yeah. it's an exercise of discovery so much. Um, all right. Well, we'll pick up with Rebecca and the servant, um, and uh, we'll go forward from there next time. So, Ray, we will not have you with us for a couple of weeks, right? That's right. That's right. I will be exploring. Wonderful. Exploring Ireland, God willing. Oh, I'll I'll enjoy it. it. That sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Eileen, I knew it you would be wonderful. Out of that. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. hope you two have a wonderful trip, Ray. I can't wait to hear about it. Post lots of pictures, please. Well, we certainly will. And uh, Sue's better at that than I am, but we'll, we'll be we'll be taking lots of pictures. So, <laughs> yes, we we will keep you disgustingly informed. We can do where in the world are Ray and Sue. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, okay. <laughs> that sounds good to me. 
<laughs> all and right. They want to know too. All right. Thanks, well, everybody. All right. Bye, thank friends. Eileen, right. thank you for thanks, joining Betty. us. We'll see you next oh, time. Thank you for inviting Bye, me. Guys. Hey, nice meeting Bye, you all. Yeah. Nice meeting Bye. You. Bye. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. How do I get out of here again? Bye. Uh, I'm Bye. having